Hello and welcome to this uh, show called City Sense. And as you know, uh, we discuss, discuss issues about cities across the globe and, of course, our own Indian cities. Uh, uh, how are Indian cities grappling with some of the basic elements of uh, livelihood, some of the basic issues of mobility, uh, sanitation, uh, and how to make our cities better, more livable. Uh, in this uh, continuity, today we have Professor Geetan Tiwari, who is uh, a professor in the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Delhi, and uh, who actually is heading a unit called the Transportation and Research Unit uh, that speaks about uh, uh, the entire issue of mobility. And I've had the opportunity to visit uh, the Institute and in fact, participate in one of the seminars there. Uh, they have astounding work and also they have, uh, 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 I wouldn't say contemporary, I mean, it's more than contemporary, you know, a kind of uh, vision. I mean, what actually ails uh, mobility in the uh, in the Indian urban spectrum. Uh, so welcome, Professor Geetam, and it's Thank really you. nice, nice that you are here. I think what is very pertinent uh, in the uh, in the Indian context is the way uh, cities are built, the way we are handling our mobility issues. Uh, take for example a small town like Simla, where the PCU is somewhere around seventy thousand. Uh, so you know, seventy thousand cars entering the town. Uh, in a, in a, in a gap of uh, almost uh, sixteen hours, it's completely unsustainable. And then the cities get choked. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways in which uh, one of the solutions that different city governments and even uh, state and national governments are suggesting to construct flyovers, widen your roads, uh, thinking that once you have a flyover, you will get rid of the traffic snarl. But we find there's more traffic snarl, there's more pollution, and I think all this is also linked to. And I've gone through the white paper that. Uh, Professor Geetam, you've brought out it's a fantastic white paper on India's mobility concerns. So I would just start from there. I mean, what does this white paper speak about? Uh, what are the challenges in Indian cities? And how do you see the future of Indian cities as far as mobility is concerned? And I think to me, mobility is not just about uh, transport per se. It's more than that. You know, it speaks about pollution. It speaks about carbon yep. footprint. And mm -hmm. it speaks about all those issues. So over to you, Professor Geetam. Thank you so much. And uh, this is really, thanks so much for inviting me to this uh, forum. And uh, I uh, I have actually heard your earlier discussions also, and I'm very uh, excited and uh, thankful to you for giving me this opportunity. So your question about uh, mobility in Indian cities, uh, let me just start with what we have tried to do in this white paper, because uh, earlier than that, we have done several other documents. This white paper specifically tries to provide a guidance to city authorities uh, how to select uh, urban transport systems, kind of give a very uh, a simple guideline which city authorities, decision makers can follow and understand that we want to make our city sustainable. We want to provide safe and efficient mobility to all road users in a city and all our cities have uh, varied road users. We have pedestrians, we have people on bicycles, we have people moving on motorized two wheelers and cars and using public transport. So essentially, how can we select a transport system which can ensure that safe and efficient options are available to all our citizens? Now, in this regard, we have to look at two uh, aspects of it. One is that what do people want? And of course, you know, across different income groups, ac across different age groups, this question will be answered differently. But essentially, people do want to move from point A to point B as fast as possible and uh, some options that they can afford easily. Now, uh, if we look at public transport systems, that is, individuals are not designing that. That is to be provided by the public authority. And uh, without going into too much detail, we already have in several other forums, and I guess in this forum also you have discussed earlier, that it's already well established that if we continue to make our planning 
uh, for cars, for personal motorized vehicles, that is not really giving us any sustainable uh, options. So it is very but clear. that is that is that is a general push also, Professor Geeta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Push so from that, I mean, you're inducing people to buy more cars because you're providing them absolutely. easy loans and all. Yeah. So I mean, so what do you, what do you? I mean, no, what definitely. So yeah. I actually I would like to explain it that you know what people want in terms of options is very much influenced by the kind of soft and hard infrastructure we create around it. For that now. Look at very simple example. So if we keep widening the roads, which you were saying earlier, because there is congestion, thinking that, you know, cars will move smoother. But it is also telling people that you should buy a car because we are going to make a very good infrastructure for you. So more cars come in the system. And there is global evidence now that this strategy doesn't work. There is enough latent demand for cars that the roads are full completely very quickly. We can also use for other modes. And th there also we have global evidence. You make a road safer for, let's say, bicycles. And initially, there are fewer people using bicycles. And uh, in our country, actually, this is very interesting data we have, that a lot of people are walking and using bicycles also, but in a very hostile environment. Yeah. And, 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 any any figure, Professor Geetha, I mean, what percentage yes. of people commute uh, yeah. on bicycle or are pedestrians for their, yeah. you know, yeah, for their life? So actually, uh, some of the best numbers we uh, started getting from uh, national census in 2011 census and the data was published in 2016 about travel surveys. And the sur census asked two questions. How do you commute to work and what distance? So this is only commute to work but not overall travel and distances. So this gave really interesting, amazing data and the, it has been published by district-wise, urban districts and rural districts. So in that we found that uh, in urban districts, the walking trips could go from minimum 25% going up to 55%. Bicycle trips also are on an average 20%. But there is a variation uh, based on the kind of states we are looking at. The states which have slightly higher per capita income, the share of bicycle goes down. Okay. But in poorer states, we still have very high percentage of bicycles. Okay. So it's also so a hierarchy we, question. I mean, that you yeah, yeah. when you need to plan the city. So, yeah, no, yeah. But overall pattern, we started understanding that uh, pedestrian trips remain almost constant regardless of incomes, regardless of type of city we are talking about. Because okay. even in Delhi, which has highest per capita uh, availability of cars in the country, 35% mm -hmm. trips are, are pedestrian trips. And this well, is, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's, I mean, the town that I come from, it's almost 44% similar. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And he, yes, absolutely. But the question is, the problem is here lies that if you look at travel pattern, yes, it's very much what we call sustainable. We want more people to walk. We want more people to use public transport. But the environment is very hostile. As far as planning is concerned, design of infrastructure is concerned, it is not meeting their requirements. Mm -hmm. So who are the people walking and using bicycles? And I would say even public transport, mm -hmm. people who don't have any choices. Mm -hmm. So today, if I'm using a bus in Delhi, I'm really looking forward to the time I can have more income and buy a two-wheeler mm -hmm. because my walk to bus stop is very difficult. Yeah. I'm waiting at a bus stop. The service is very unreliable. Mm -hmm. And when I get a bus, it's crowded. Yeah. Okay, you can say we are designing metro systems in many cities, which is true. Mm -hmm. More than 16 cities in India have invested in designing metro system. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the issue with metro system? Mm -hmm. So in this white paper we showed there are two aspects in mm -hmm. using any public transport system, yeah. but okay. also the question of affordability. So one is that when we are looking at the trip distribution, the numbers that we started understanding uh, in detail from census, majority trips are also short trips. Okay, so About, what does that mean? I'm in, in, so in, in, it in, means in that yeah. yeah, less than five kilometer is the most dominant kind of trips. People are not traveling very long distances to go to work. 
Okay. Less than five kilometers. In Delhi, we found less uh, forty percent trips are less than five kilometers, okay. and almost about sixty to seventy percent trips are less than. 10 kilometers. 10 kilometers yeah. Then we looked at overall district patterns, what we got from census. So we found that uh, long trips, longer than 20 kilometer, is kind of stable and is hovering around 6 to 7 percent only. Okay. okay. But uh, the medium trips that we are looking at, let's say more than 5 kilometers up to 15, uh, 20 kilometers, is about 30, 40 percent. Okay. So what's the understanding? Why are we discussing about trip dis distances? Yeah, because the yeah. type of public transport that we provide has an yeah. implication for that. Okay. So if I provide a metro system, so we did the calculations that it's shown in that white paper. So if you do, if I'm going only three kilometers up to five kilometers, in fact, and in the best case scenario, metro stop is only five minutes away from my home. Mm -hmm. I take five minutes walk to metro stop. It's a very good sy system. Every two minutes I have a train. So I wait only every three minutes, actually. That is the best possible scenario right now. So I wait for about two, three minutes for the train. And since I have gone up and down, so that's because it's not at grade. So it's taken additional two, three minutes. So about 12 minutes I have spent before boarding the metro. Okay, three kilometers, a short distance, I quickly travel and I get down. Yeah. But if I calculate door-to-door -door journey time, yeah. it is that's, about 20-25 minutes for a three-kilometer yeah. trip. Three kilometer journey. Yeah. If I had okay. bicycled, it would yeah, take yeah. only 12 minutes. Absolutely, yeah. So extend this to the implication of long and short trips. Mm -hmm. That is the part which is discussed here. That up to about 10 to 12 kilometers... And longer than five kilometers, bus is a good option. Okay. Why it is better than metro? Because it is at great. Mm -hmm. We are not going up or down. Mm -hmm. In metro system, either you have to go underground, yeah, you have to climb yeah. up. Climb up. So yeah. that's additional. Mm -hmm. And then bus, if you are able to create a few priorities for it. And also, Professor Gitam, the pricing question, because, you know, the Absolutely. bus is far cheaper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the next issue, which is discussed in the white paper. Mm -hmm. For Metro, we estimated that uh, your household income mm -hmm. minimum has to be 36,000 rupees per month for one person to use Metro to go mm -hmm. to work every day. Okay. But if you're using a bus, the average household income can be 12,000 rupees. Okay. There's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. So today also you find who are the people using metro systems that we have provided. It is the middle class people and young people. Mm -hmm. It's not really very old people or very children. Because the way, you know, again, any public transport is all about how you provide access to it. How am I walking? Is it safe walking environment? Those are the issues we haven't solved, neither for bus nor for metro, unfortunately. And for Metro, we've invested so much money. So that's the other thing, you know, this talks about, we don't get into too much of financing because my take is no public transport can make profits from fare box. This is globally is known. It's a public service. And it's a public service because if we are able to do it well, then we are meeting SDG 11.2 which is providing a quality public transport within 500 meters Absolutely, of working yeah. distance. Mm -hmm. Now that has many other implications. Yeah, Public transport is better for um, CO2 emissions, for any other local emissions also, because even a CNG run or diesel bus is better than your petrol car. Yeah. I, Professor Gitam, I just remember, because before we just uh, move further, I remember, you know, you pointing out from cradle to crest. That's how we measure yeah. the carbon footprint, okay? <laughs> and you had pointed out that the diesel bus is far better than your 10 EV cars. Or, I mean, you know, the, now there's another push that's coming up for uh, uh, for these. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, electrification now. For we the are private in... electrical vehicles. Yeah, yeah. Actually, so how do you the... see this transition transformation taking place? So, I mean, so first bit, I think we have lost the whole discussion of public transport 
it's been hijacked by metro instead mm-hmm. of really investing in buses you know all buses, cities yeah. you've seen yeah. in that paper so that's also. that's the first important point that first it's important been completely hijacked. Because, yeah. you know yeah because yeah. now you're not discussing about buses yeah, yeah. not creating as a system yeah. and just stand alone metro system is being viewed as though it's yeah. going to solve all problems yeah. Yeah. and it's explained that why that is i mean we witness it we yeah. haven't solved congestion we haven't solved pollution, yeah. pollution. and the uh, traffic safety which is another big public health issue continues yeah. to dominate majority people who drive in, die in urban areas in road traffic crashes are pedestrians and yeah. motorized two wheelers yeah. so second part now in last few years we've started seeing that in the name of improving buses with the whole debate has gone into technology discussion okay that we will bring electric buses and electric two wheelers and that's going to solve our yeah. complete uh, you know pollution yeah. and co2 emission problems so co2 emission is already there are number of studies which show that uh, when we talk about co2 it's not about what is being emitted while the vehicle is operated it is from cradle to grave basically when grave, yeah, yeah. the vehicle is produced yeah, yeah. create infrastructure yeah. where the resources are coming from then and how the system is operated and then when you get rid of the system every system is going to have a life what kind of resources are uh, in in um, available for the, uh, that process so for the reason metro system which is run on electricity in india doesn't look too good for co2 because our electricity is still coal based hmm. i think 84% comes from from thermal isn't it to the it is slightly changed now because in okay. last few years we've had lot of uh, push for uh, renewable energies renewable energy. it is still about 68 to 70% okay so 70% let's say yeah so it okay. is and unless we clean source of electricity hmm. we will not have yeah. any co2 benefit yeah. that's one that's very important now we have lot of push for electric buses in india also you have fame one fame two schemes by central mm-hmm. government but there are two issues there number one any public transport and se- certainly bus transport is not about only technology mm-hmm. it's about creating a system. system it's about ensuring affordability if you are not answering that question that electrification just moving from petrol diesel cng to electric buses doesn't solve that problem second very interestingly uh some very recent papers have come out these are 22 23 publications and that is showing that in fact for electric cars so the paper compared electric cars versus uh petrol driven cars and diesel driven cars now electric cars have a battery so it is heavier and because of that there are two types of emissions which are happening in uh, while the vehicle is operating one is the tailpipe tailpipe is better in electric because it is cleaner but the resuspended particulate matter which happens okay. because of tires moving tires, yeah. Yeah, and it yeah. is throwing up the dust in the air dust, yeah. yeah now these are heavier vehicles so these initial studies are showing that there is more rspm okay so there is kind of i would say there is already a debate in the academic circle now is it really benefiting <laughs> okay so again again you spin extent. the wheel and come back to a new spiral yeah yes yeah yeah so i <laughs> yeah. think any new technology we have yeah. to understand very carefully and uh, so we have to understand how it's going to perform for example electric bus performance in indian conditions mm-hmm. which is overloaded buses we have much higher ambient temperatures in summer we yeah. don't understand it correctly mm-hmm. so we have to tread it slowly i'm not saying don't do it but we don't have enough information to completely say okay we will just go electric in next 10 years and yeah. solve problems that is not so happening. two 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 other important questions professor geetam because before we wind up this show the first one is because there's very interesting point that you read us earlier but probably in the conversation we missed that and that is what people want hmm. so you know and when we are planning such uh, uh, such mode of transport in different cities so we do not even think about that what people want 
all what people want is all induced from the top or is there some parallel consciousness also developing amongst the people how does the white paper speak about that that's the first thing yeah, the yeah. second I mean, second second hmm. point is i mean uh, uh, maybe I, I, I'll, I'll put it just right right away is i mean wow what do you see as a future you know for a more sustainable mm-hmm. urban planning stuff what could be the ways in which we 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 do you know we, we just bring people to the fore and then you know start the planning process in a far better legitimate participatory manner yeah so these two questions yeah so you know what people want is easy to understand because we can reflect upon our own behavior and see people around us yeah. uh, what is happening so as i said very simply people want to move from point a to point b as fast as possible now we look at all the factors which influences our choices it seems that convenience and comfort dominates any other uh, that's the first thing absolutely okay. okay affordability comes very close to it we can even consider you know many countries think uh, talk about and they do provide completely free public but, transport because it before, has before, the before, before, social before, benefits. Before, yeah before professor let me just dwell more on that because i'm really liking it oh. Do you also not think when you you are writing the development plans, what you call the master plans in India, you know, take for example now the 2041 master plan speaks about TODs. You know, when you write master plans, it should not just be limited to your land use plan, but mobility yeah, should be absolutely. a quintessential section. Okay, where are the, the employment going to get generated? Where are people going to stay? So that commute is one of the quintessential aspects of the master plan. Absolutely. Do you not think that that is an essential element which is missing in the overall? Very, idea? very essential element. And this we analyzed in another publication that, you know, your whole choice of mobility, trip patterns, etc., actually starts from the way we are planning our cities. Yeah, yeah. How okay, so, is so it that is also in use, yeah. What are the densities? What how we are planning different activities? So my choice whether I'm going to walk or use any other mode first comes from there. Hmm. If I have to travel longer distances, walking is out. Okay. If we have very mixed land use patterns, it does encourage walking and bicycling. Yeah, yeah. And so mixed uh, so land use is another important issue. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the two things that you know we did very detailed work in a couple of small cities because we thought. Nobody is really walking, talking about these small cities. We have 400 small cities. Mm-hmm. So, for example, we started looking at Patiala, a rich yeah. city, small city, no dearth of resources. But yeah. what about, you know, thinking about SDG compliant mobility planning? Okay. Are you thinking about how you will provide public transport, how it will have impact on air pollution, what impact it will have on your walking trips, safety of pedestrians, etc.? So we found in the master plan of Patiala, there is no discussion. There is one yeah, little yeah. paragraph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we attempted and discussed with the town planner, why not have a like whole chapter? Yeah. And you talk about SDG compliant mobility plan yeah. becomes part of your master plan. Yeah, yeah. And you have a vision, 20 years, like master plans are for 20 years. Yeah, yeah. 20 years from now, we want to achieve this. Yeah. And then you work backwards okay in next five years we will do step one two three and so on so i think including mobility sdg uh, uh, compliance mobility as part of a master plan document is the stage where we should stop definitely start and then there is other part coming which is you know your revision of indian roads congress guidelines because next step is, okay, you have to do details at the road. Mm-hmm. See, mobility is planning, but at my choices are also depend on what the design of the infrastructure is. Okay. Do I have proper footpath? Do I have safe crossing facility? That would also influence my choice. Mm-hmm. So design also, this detailed design matters a lot. Mm-hmm. And third, then, of course, comes about reliability, comfort, convenience. Because if a bus is not reliable and I have a two-wheeler, I will end up using a two-wheeler. Okay. Two-wheeler may be very fuel efficient, very comfortable and convenient, but it has the highest risk of getting involved in traffic crashes. Traffic crash. yeah. Today, when we look at our data, 40 to almost 45% deaths are mm-hmm. people using two-wheelers. 
So two even of... after wearing a helmet, yeah. Yeah. you still have very high risk. Okay, and and so so two wheelers does not include the cyclists. I mean, two wheelers are basically no, motorized I transport. Meant motorized two wheelers. Motorized yeah. transport, yeah. Because okay. of speed, yeah, you know, motorized two wheeler yeah. goes at much higher speed. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. cyclist, uh, of the because they go at lower speed, uh, do not seem to have the same level of risk. Of course, because we don't create safe infrastructure for bicycles, yeah. so because of that, they do face also risk. So risk is really to pedestrians, bicycles, and motorized two wheelers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And definitely pedestrian and bicycle we can solve by providing better infrastructure. So last proof, Sagita. I mean, what do you think should be the way forward? Yeah. Because because you know we've seen uh, uh, the seventy fourth amendment was mm -hmm. like completely usurped by the special purpose vehicle model of the yeah. smart cities that didn't give any. any I mean, I mean. Uh, people in path, hot look, once we have the SPV, it will be project oriented, we have the best mindset, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing has happened. And in fact, yeah, we have yeah. worsened from, we've gone from bad to worse, honestly speaking. Yeah. So what do you think should be the way forward in which we make, and as you've rightly said, I mean, nowhere in the world, I mean, there can be an alternative to public transport. You know, you, I mean, your private cars can't just take over uh, those spaces. And these are not the sustainable ways yeah. of of moving ahead. I think so for what are the sustainable ways yeah, for planning, think, for engineering, for design. So what I find a big uh, block which is missing in um, uh, enabling our cities to have more sustainable mobility is that we are not able to have an integrated planning or design mechanisms. Okay. By and which how do you do I mean, that? Yeah. So that? I. So there, at present, I don't see any institutional setup in cities, okay. Okay. which can, you know, so yes, master plan, we talk about everything. But then we start planning buses separately. We start planning roads is, you know, it's not, people are not seeing that your choices are also dependent on the way we planning roads. Mm -hmm. And uh, safety issue is also about the way we are planning roads and how people are walking. We are planning Metro as a standalone system mm -hmm. and all money is coming from the center. Yeah. So that little bit money that the state states have for urban transport is all being funded, uh, going into Metro systems mm -hmm. at the cost of creating appropriate infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I would say we have to look at institutional mechanisms, okay. which and that comes from perhaps from having your 74th Amendment, mm -hmm. decentralized institutional mechanisms in a city who is responsible for creating this vision document. Then what mechanisms we have that we have integrated designs for buses for and mm -hmm. one thing that we did not discuss actually in majority of Indian cities, small cities, yeah. mobility is being provided by what we call intermediate public transport systems or informal systems yeah yeah absolutely that's the because there yeah. is a demand for it mm. and we can't wish away we cannot yeah, run yeah. buses in small cities yeah, yeah so we have to include it so by inclusion this is what i mean by integrated integrated okay. how to have in informal or ipt bus systems and metro mm -hmm. all planned uh, operation level integration and design level integration. Okay. okay. That's the institutional mechanisms we have to create that these three level of integration should be possible. Oops, Metro I should not be okay. on its own. And we know you've seen in that white paper, we've talked, we've put together the numbers. Even in Delhi, after creating 400 kilometers of Metro, hmm. the ridership is 46% of what it was estimated, projected yes. to be. Still, yeah. And other small systems, it's like 2%, 5%. Yeah. Much yeah, to the capacity. Yeah, Kochi, I mean, we've seen Kochi and even other. Yeah, one. yeah. Uh, it's hard, hardly. Uh, yeah. I mean, hardly so buses have to be very well. I mean, I would say your road-based system is the basic system. Okay. Yes, for long trips, metro is an attractive option. But if it's not integrated and all your money goes to creating a small metro system, that doesn't solve I mean, then I think it's a construction project. 
it's not a public transport project. So we don't want a construction project. We have public yeah. transport. You. Yeah, we want so, solutions. So, so the last, yes. And the last thing again, I mean, where do the people figure it out in this whole process of the alternatives that we talk? Because you you spoke about institutional mechanism, you spoke about, you spoke about, you know, integrated, but it's more about systems. But where are the people, you know, so that people are part and process of yeah. this uh, I mean, entire planning paradigm. I think it is this, you know, basically the policy planning, the master plan documents, unless they have very strong uh, public participation. Mm -hmm. And you know that we've always had difficulty with that because the moment we mean public, it is, you know, this in this very heterogeneous group. Yeah. How are we going to in integrate people who are actually walking, who have no voices, yeah. people using low income, people who are using buses? I mean, today in Delhi, you have almost 20, still 20% 20 people using buses. Wow. But are we really doing a lot of planning for it? Mm. And forget Delhi, look at any other city. Mm. Majority people are using IPTs, buses, yeah. but the investment is going into creating these capital intensive infrastructure, either metro okay. or flyovers, yeah. which is also not meeting the mobility for so people's voices and uh, mechanisms for participation of this level, okay. you know, I would say the silent majority is missing right okay. now. Okay. Whether your 74th Amendment is able to uh, uh, enable that, I think that's what we should work for. Otherwise, uh, we will continue to have these, you know, capital intensive construction projects. So great. Uh, and thanks, Professor Gitam, for really uh, sparing out the time and really uh, bringing out uh, uh, the white paper that you produced. I mean, it's, it's probably uh, in the academic circles is one of the finest works I've seen in the recent past. And um, I assume that uh, this discussion will further kind of provoke or maybe give some play as a role of a catalyst, yeah. you know, maybe in some kind of churning and then we'll, I mean, maybe some some kind of uh, yeah, alternatives that we, that, we, that we, yeah, let's hope for that. But I think the three, four uh, takeaways which are very important. And the first one is we require more integrated system, more institutionalized mechanism, more people centric, and not just be the construction projects, but it has to be overall larger mobility uh, package that we talk about, you know for the people to commute in the cities. Thank you, Professor Geetam, and uh, uh, I, I hope we'll, we'll meet again. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.